Welcome back, biologists. In case you're looking for an explanation for how natural selection works, um, I'm glad that you're here because you came to the right place. So today we'll be talking about how uh, the theory of natural selection works. Natural selection is a way to describe how evolution occurs. It's a theory because it's a well-tested group of hypotheses that um, have a lot of evidence supporting them, and they've been elevated and altered slightly, um, but elevated to the status of a theory. Remember, theory in the world of science is very, very different from a theory in um, common language use. So this concept of change over time or evolution is not a new idea. Um, it's been written about for a long time, so over 2,000 years. Um, and uh, Darwin was not the first person to try to come up with a, an explanation for how change over time occurs. As a matter of fact, there was someone who lived before Darwin, and this person is Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. And Lamarck was um, a, a French naturalist, and he made observations about the world around him. And he noticed that certain organisms seemed to be similar to each other and greatly different from other kinds of species on the planet. And so what he um, hypothesized was he hypothesized that organisms modified their behavior, somehow um, developed new traits because of a need to. Um, for example, an organism might um, develop a, a thicker, thicker fur in an effort to withstand cold temperatures. And that's how new traits came about. Of course, we have better understanding and we know all that that's not the case. If we were trying to use Lamarckian thought as a way to explain how the long neck from a giraffe or for a giraffe came about, um, we might explain it this way, that once again, maybe there was, a, there was a, a situation of drought and there wasn't enough food available for the ancestors of the giraffes. But some giraffes, you know, because there was this need to, they stretched their necks. They, they tried so hard. They reached, reached, reached for those leaves high up in the tree and they got them. And then they also passed those traits down to their offspring. So their offspring then were born with this longer neck. Again, this can't be true. It's not. It's wrong. We understand that if something happens to us, our offspring aren't necessarily affected by that. For example, if I were to um, get a tattoo and then later on reproduce, my offspring do not would not be born with tattoos. If we take a mouse and we cut off its tail, we've altered the traits of that mouse. Yet when that mouse reproduces, it's going to have offspring that have tails. The reason why the the offspring of that mouse has tails is because the parent mouse passes down alleles on chromosomes and those alleles code for the formation of proteins, which is what causes the tail to form in the first place in the mouse. So this concept of acquired characteristics that an organism can change its phenotype during its lifetime and then pass down that trait to its offspring is not supported by science. So here we get to Darwin. Interesting fact, Darwin was born at the exact same day as Abraham Lincoln, February 12th, 1809. Anyway, a famous quote from Darwin is that I have called this principle by which each, each slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection. Nature chooses what traits get passed on and which traits do not get passed on. Now, Darwin was influenced um, in his studies by a uh, individual who came before him by the name of Sir Charles Lyell. Lyell was a geologist, and he came up with this concept of uniformitarianism. I'll say it one more time for you. I know I talk quickly, and it's sometimes hard to understand me, but that word is uniformitarianism. And the basic idea behind uniformitarianism is that what has happened in the past is still present today. There were earthquakes in the past, just as there are earthquakes today. There were volcanoes that erupted in the past, and there are volcanoes that erupt today. Land experiences erosion in the past, and land experiences erosion today. And so Darwin thought about that, and he thought about, you know, could there have been organisms that existed in the past, 
And could those organisms then have led to the organisms that we find on the planet today? In the end, Darwin came up with, with his explanation, his way to describe how organisms change over time. And he called it natural selection. The first factor or principle related to natural selection is that organisms produce more offspring than can possibly survive. I keep bringing up the fish eggs in Nemo in class, and there we've got a picture of those, um, of a, an example of some kind of fish and its eggs that it would have laid. There's a lot of potential offspring there, and probably too many then can possibly survive because of some um, limited resources that are present in the environment. In certain locations around the planet, we have problems with overpopulation. Another individual who also influenced Darwin's thinking was this guy by the name of Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus was an economist. He's someone who studied um, population and specifically the human population. And he determined that um, in nature, plants and animals produce far more offspring than can possibly survive. And if that's the case, then isn't man also capable of overproducing if their population is left unchecked? Well, there's definite constraints on the human population. We haven't necessarily reached them yet, but the greatest factor that will affect the size that the human population can possibly get to is water, potable water, water that we can drink. Anyway, Darwin um, did a lot of readings or, or went through the readings of Malthus and Malthus's thoughts greatly influenced Darwin's explanation for how populations change over time. And in the end, from Malthus, Darwin also said that there is overproduction of offspring. Organisms tend to have more offspring than can possibly survive in a given habitat. As populations grow in size, there's um, limited natural resources, and those limitations on the natural resources force organisms to compete with each other. We can't have exponential growth of a population. Pretty soon the population will crash because it's going to run out of one of those necessary factors that's needed for a population to exist, such as food, such as shelter, such as access to water, such as space. So once again, there's competition that exists within a population of a particular species, but there's also competition that exists in a given ecosystem between members of the same species that occupy, or sorry, between members of different species that occupy the same trophic level. What I mean by that is, you know, there could be two different predators that prey upon maybe a beetle. Different kinds of birds, maybe some other kinds of organisms might also eat that beetle. So different species of organisms living in a given ecosystem compete against each other. They compete against each other for food, water, shelter, and space. The only thing that organisms of the same species compete against each other for that they don't compete against other species for is mates. So we have to remember that because there are too many organisms that are produced because of reproduction in a given area, this is going to induce competition between those members of the population. We also know that inherited variations exist in all populations. These variations are just differences in given traits. And what I have on the screen is I have two different kinds of shells that you might find on some kind of a bivalve like a mollusk or you might find on a snail. Now, all of these shells here belong to the same species of mollusk. All of these shells down here belong to the same species of a snail. But yet you can see there's great variation in the coloring, in some cases in the um, texture of that shell. And that variation might result in certain members of that population having some kind of a selective advantage. They might somehow be better off because they have the information to make a particular kind of shell. Now variation comes about because of two different reasons. In every single population, variation comes about because of mutation. 
As we talked about in our DNA replication unit, that um, DNA polymerase makes an error in copying DNA in about once in every one million nitrogen-based pair that it matches up to an existing uh, nucleotide or, or nitrogen base. So the potential for error to occur is pretty high. Sometimes these mutations get passed on, sometimes they don't. Sometimes these mutations are silent, sometimes they're not. And so sometimes these mutations have the potential to affect some kind of phenotype. And that's what we see going on in these two images. Another way to get variation into populations that reproduce sexually is simply the idea of, you know, different combinations of alleles presence, present in egg and sperm coming together at fertilization. So in the end, we have to remember this concept of variation. This image that you see on the screen is a uh, image that shows you variation that exists in white oak leaves. All 10 of those samples are different white oaks or from different white oak trees. Those leaves are from different white oak trees, but they're all white oaks. They're all the exact same species, but you can see there's great variation in the lobing and the um, formation or the arrangement and organization to the leaf, the pattern that you see. All right, number three. Because organisms must compete for limited resources, they struggle to exist. This is where we're getting to the survival of the fittest concept or part of our explanation for how natural selection works. If um, organisms don't get the resources that they need, they're going to die. And again, because we have variation between members of a given population, some members of the population might have some kind of selective advantage. The advantage was an inherited trait, so something that they inherited from their biological parents or parents that's going to offer them some kind of an advantage. Those traits or characteristics that help an organism to survive, we call them adaptations. And you can see different examples of adaptations possibly in these finches that are found in the Galapagos Islands, located off the coast of Ecuador. These finches were very well studied by Darwin as he um, completed his trip around the world, as he learned about different uh, naturally occurring uh, phenomena and different organisms in different places around the world. We have great variation in the shape of the beak in these different finches, but the shape, of the shape of the beak in this case is responsible for determining what kind of food each kind of finch is able to eat. This finch up here with its really strong, thick bill is able to crack open nuts and get to the meat that's inside of there. This finch over here that has this long pointy kind of beak is able to get insects that are crawling along the bark of a tree. The traits that better help an organism or enable them to survive, make an organism more fit and affect their fitness we typically refer to this as that concept of survival of the fittest, where fitness is defined as the ability of an organism to survive and reproduce. A lot of people think that fitness is just this concept about survival, but it's really about reproduction. Species need to continue on. And an individual living a long, long time but not reproducing isn't necessarily the fittest one of that particular population. On the other hand, the organism that reproduces and has a ton of offspring, and those offspring are healthy, well, that organism is pretty fit. So remember, survival of the fittest. Finally, organisms that survive can pass on their traits to their offspring. They're able to reproduce. Organisms that are best fit for their environment can produce more offspring than those that are unfit. An individual either survives or doesn't but it's populations that can possibly adapt or evolve. Differential reproduction is that concept that the organisms that have the favorable traits are going to be able to survive, they're going to have more reproductive opportunities, and we're going to see an increase in the allele frequency of a particular trait, their favorable trait, in the population over time. We see a decrease in the frequency of phenotypes that are unfavorable in that population over time until eventually maybe that particular phenotype is no longer present in that population. And now the population has changed. 
Now all members of the population have a blue shell, maybe. Or maybe all members of that population are tan-colored beetles and the green ones have been wiped out. Or maybe all members of that particular population are organisms that can walk on four limbs and walk well on those four limbs. Maybe they all have a tail of a certain length, or maybe they all have a beak of a certain length. Maybe they have spikes on themselves, like a, um, the spikes that you find on a puffer fish. But again, differential reproduction is this concept that the organisms that have survived, the organisms that have survived the selective pressure are going to reproduce, they're going to reproduce more frequently, and they're going to have offspring that have similar traits to them. So how does this possibly lead to um, change over time? Again, over many generations, possibly hundreds or thousands of years, or maybe even just 100, maybe even just 12, as we'll see in a couple of different videos, the characteristics of a population can change. Again, when Darwin was writing up his explanation for how natural selection occurs and how evolution occurs, you know, he wasn't exactly comfortable with this particular concept. He had been, um, he had a certain history. He um, was told he was going to be a doctor by his father, and so he went to medical school and he got sick while watching his first surgery. So he knew that that was not going to be an option. So then he decided to study religion and he went to seminary and he was about to be ordained. And he just didn't necessarily feel that that was the best path for him. So he ended up getting a job um, courtesy of his cousin as the naturalist on a ship that was going to sail around the world. Um, and he gathered a lot of information that he used as evidence to support his explanation for how evolution occurs. But he sat on his work for about 20 years. And while he was deliberating and thinking about whether or not he should publish his work, along comes Alfred Russell Wallace. And Wallace came up with explanations for how populations change over time, pretty similar to what Darwin came up with. Um, someone contacted or, or reached out to the two of them and said, hey, you guys should talk. And so in the end, after examining, uh, after communicating with each other and, and then um, examining each other's evidence, Wallace was the better guy in a sense. He said to Darwin, he's like, you've got a lot more information and you've been thinking about this for a lot longer than I have. You need to publish. I'll make sure to support your your findings. And uh, you know we can have somewhat of a partnership, but you really need to get all the credit. And, and he does. But again, Darwin wasn't the only person who came up with this concept of natural selection. A lot of people have been asking me how we get new species. And new species come about if there are enough differences that have accumulated within um, different populations of a given species. But typically what has to happen is that and a given population has to be separated somehow. Something needs to come up and um, divide that population into two, into two parts. The two populations become isolated from each other. They can't uh, migrate back and forth. And over time then, um, they accumulate different kinds of mutations. And then should their paths ever cross again in the future, they can't reproduce with each other to have fertile offspring. And that's where the two different species come about. Hmm. So in summary, the images didn't turn out exactly the way I wanted to. Um, typically, mutation or sexual reproduction is going to lead to variation in, in the population. Some kind of selective pressure is going to choose for some variation and against another variation. Certain members of the population have an advantage, whereas other ones have a disadvantage for having a certain variety of a trait. The trait that has the selective advantage is going to be called the adaptation. It is the favorable trait. And over time, we should see an increase in the frequency of that trait in the population, such that maybe at some point there is no longer variation for that trait in the population. We see just one version of it, like humans having a four-chambered heart versus a three-chambered heart. We don't have humans that have three-chambered three -chambered hearts. We all have two ventricles on the bottom and two atrium on the top. Organisms that have the adaptation are going to be able to reproduce at a greater rate than organisms that are being selected against by the selective pressure. <laughs>
And this is gonna bring about changes in phenotype in the population over time. As always, if you have any questions, please make sure to ask. You can email me, you can ask me in class. Let me know what you need. Take care.